Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Alfonso Caramazza uh, from Psychology, and together with uh, Algala Burda from Neurology, I'm co-director of the Mind, Brain, and Behavior Interfaculty Initiative. Welcome uh, to this, the second lecture by Ernst Furr. Uh, professor Furr is a professor of economics and director of the Institute for Empirical Research in Economics at the University of Zurich. Uh, the MBB, uh, as I hope, I think most of you know, is a university-wide effort uh, whose mission is to um, uh, promote, to encourage uh, the uh, interdisciplinary uh, activities in the study of the human mind and brain and behavior. And uh, the activities include uh, various types of, uh, uh, of meetings, uh, various funding for projects, research uh, of an interdisciplinary nature. And one of the major um, uh, activities of the, uh, of the MBB is the distinguished lectures that are given every year. And uh, this year's distinguished lecturer is Professor Ernst uh, Furr. Uh, in previous years, uh, we've had other distinguished lecturers, I just mentioned a few, uh, Noam Chomsky, Martha McClintock, William Newsom, um, and uh, uh, Stan DeHaan, Daniel Kahneman, um, uh, Daniel Dennett, and many others, uh, all of whom have uh, engaged um, the deep questions about the interaction of uh, mind, brain, and behavior. As, uh, as you heard yesterday from uh, David Leibson's introduction to Professor Furr's lectures. Uh, uh, Professor Furr has been uh, amazingly productive in the areas of economics and cognitive neuroscience. And as uh, David Leibson put it, uh, his work has been revolutionary. Uh, the revolution that he referred to is the introduction of uh, the role of altruism and cooperation in economic analysis. Um, I'm not an economist, uh, but according to Leibson, uh, uh, economists have tended to uh, privilege uh, more competition uh, than cooperation and uh, altruism. And the work of Professor uh, Furr and his uh, students has played a central role in uh, shifting the focus to include a closer analysis of the role of altruism and cooperation. Uh, Professor Furr has received many honors for his work, uh, including um, the Gosson Prize, the Cogito Prize, the Dutwala Prize, and many other medals and prizes, uh, including an honorary uh, doctorate degree. Uh, yesterday's uh, lecture um, was entitled The Neurobiology of Human Altruism. It generated uh, a lively discussion uh, afterwards, uh, and we are uh, sure, we're confident that today's lecture will do the same. His lecture today is entitled Neuroeconomics as a Unifying Approach Towards Understanding the Human Mind and Individual Behavior. A fairly major challenge uh, in terms of uh, what, uh, uh, what topic is, is, is tackling. Um, we'll see whether neuroeconomics actually can support uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, claim. Uh, the talk will be followed by uh, a brief commentary by Dresden Prelek. Uh, who is Professor of Management Science and Economics at MIT. Please join me uh, to welcome uh, Professor Ernst again. So thank you very much for the introduction. So I will, of course, not live up to the promise of my title. <laughs> I will only move a few millimeters in the right direction, I think. But... Uh, I think that's already something, uh, and we'll see at the end uh, how satisfied you are. So uh, let me start uh, uh, by giving you an outline of what I'm going to do today. I will, at the beginning, shortly talk about the different approaches towards understanding human behavior that prevail in economics, psychology, and, neuro and neuroeconomics. Uh, and then I will have uh, a section where I discuss various types of evidence that suggest that neuronal activity is indeed causal for very important behaviors, economic and social behaviors. And finally, I will concentrate most of my talk on, on something that 
at least economists are very interested in, but potentially, I guess, everybody is interested in, namely, to what extent can we perform out-of-sample predictions? You see, I mean, there's a lot of fitting exercises in neuroscience, in psychology, in economics, and often we are content with saying, oh, I have a gr great fit, look at this graph, uh, and then, but in the end, you have just taken the parameters you estimated from the data and show that these parameters have a good fit to the prevailing data. So the really interesting and re very challenging task is to what extent can you predict out of sample uh, when you put people in a different situation? And to some extent, if I have time, I talk about that, even across individuals. So for example, one, challenging, one challenge is, is it possible to look at patterns of brain connectivity in one human brain and, or, and identify a particular pattern of brain connectivity. And then I look at a particular individual and, can, and say, oh, that's exactly the pattern that's associated with empathizing. Or that's exactly the pattern that's associated with feeling gratitude. And I will show you a data set that indicates that this is possible. Okay, so, so let me start uh, by uh, the economic approach. Well, as economists, uh, we try to understand behavior in terms of human responses to changes in constraints. So what's our bread and butter issues is if you change prices, if you change taxes, if you change incentives, then how do people change to these changes in external stimuli or how how do they change their behavior in response to uh, informational changes? And we typically uh, neglect how the mind works in this endeavor. And graphically, you can represent this with these little boxes. So we have external stimuli. We assume that people have preferences and beliefs. And the external stimuli, which determine, for example, our action space, uh, together with preferences and beliefs, determine individual behavior. And what are external stimuli? Well, incentives, prices, taxes, information, and so on. Okay, there's no interest in how the human mind works. And it's interesting that the, our profession has been amazingly productive with this very impoverished notion of individual behavior. Uh, uh, but that's another issue why this is the case. Now, if you look at psychologists, they are, of course, also interested in external stimuli. Although they, they tend to look at broader classes of stimuli. For example, they, they tend to accept not to look just on incentives and information, but perhaps also on social norms and on the different types of frames that affect people's beliefs and attention. Uh, but there's something missing in between, and that's the main interest of psychologists, which is uh, they want to understand the link between external environmental stimuli and individual behavior in terms of how the human mind works. And, and these are the missing boxes here. Uh, so basically, the human, every, all these external stimuli, they have to be processed by the human mind in some way. And in order to, if you want, and by understanding the human mind better, we may understand much better how individual behavior comes about. Now, the, the neuroeconomic approach, and this is, in, in this sense, I mean unifying, Maybe it could also be called the neuroscientific approach, it's, or the, the decision neuroscience, or you can give it different names, but it's uh, this focus on the brain and on behavior, so to speak, um, adds a little bit of complexity to the previous picture that characterizes the psychological program, uh, namely by introducing uh, a, a further step, because all these external stimuli, they are processed by the human brain. And the human brain then affects the human mind. And I will show you compelling evidence, in my view at least compelling, that there is really a causal link here. So that the neural processing has a causal impact on how the human mind works. And so basically, in this approach, we want to understand the interactions between neuronal populations and how they affect the workings of the human mind and finally how that affects individual behavior. Okay, and in this sense I mean uh, unifying, so to speak. Of course, it can also go the other way around to some extent. 
And that's very important to keep it in mind that the way how the human mind functions may also impact neural firing and actually does it. And through, let's say, training and socialization, that may even have a, a profound impact on the brain, even on brain anatomy. And so it's a pretty complicated picture that we have by now, and, but that's how the world is, and we have to come to grips with it. Now, let me, uh, so a, a precondition to make this approach possible is that this claim is true. Okay, so therefore I focus, therefore I focus in the next few slides on, on some evidence from non-invasive brain stimulation studies that indicate that really very important behaviors can be changed often in a dramatic way by applying transcranial magnetic stimulation or transcranial direct current stimulation uh, to the human brain. Uh, so let me start. Uh, well, first I show you a few nice pictures how we do this. This is transcranial magnetic stimulation. Many of you know that. Uh, Transcranial direct current stimulation is even simpler. You put an anode and a cathode on the brain. It sounds very simple. It's more complicated than that in, in, in the end. But in Zurich, we are able now to stimulate 16 people simultaneously with trans direct uh, current stimulation, which is kind of neat because it's, it's very cumbersome to bring each subject one by one to the lab. And having 16 simultaneously it's almost, uh, it's quite remarkable, I think, that you can uh, stimulate 16 minds. And I, I, I believe there will soon be a few labs that can stimulate 20 or 30 people simultaneously. And you, you have really powerful control because you can upregulate some of these people's brains by anodal stimulation or you can downregulate it. So you have uh, basically, ran, you randomize anodal and cathodal stimulation to these brains and you have really nice control because everything else is then equal. Uh, whereas when you, individuals come one by one, it may be an influence of time of the day, of the weather conditions or whatever. Okay, so uh, let me come to the claim that neuronal activity or connectivity causally influences many important behaviors. So in our first studies here, we concentrated on the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and we ran what's called an ultimatum game. And for those who don't know that game, it's a very simple game. Two people are anonymously paired. One guy gets $20 in this game. The other guy has nothing initially. The guy who has the money can make proposals how to divide it. Let's say player A makes the proposal. Player B can say yes or no. And if it's yes, it's implemented the proposal. If no, both get nothing. Okay, it's a very simple but powerful game. Because by saying no, if I get an offer, for example, here, and we concentrate on these offers, let's say, you take 16 and I get four, I may view that as pretty unfair, and that may induce me to reject that offer, to sacrifice $4 in order to punish you. And we looked exactly at this kind of behavior, but we stimulated people's brains uh, on the right DLPFC, on the left side as a control condition, and and uh, also in some studies we had a placebo stim actually this study also we had a placebo stimulation so uh, so and what turns out to be the case is what you see on this picture uh, this is the rejection rate of unfair offers after left TMS and think of left TMS really as the identical to a placebo condition because we know that left TMS is not different from a placebo stimulation but now you look at the right side, right stimulation, right DLPFC stimulation, you basically bring down the rejection rate from 80% to 40%. That's really amazing how big that behavioral effect is with uh, a non-invasive brain stimulation. Uh, and uh, so that was one of our first studies. Actually, we did it with Alvaro Pascal Leone, who is from Harvard. He gave great advice to us novices in TMS and helped us to conduct this study. Uh, now, uh, yeah, oh, many of you have been here yesterday or, already, and therefore I can go very quickly through this slide. You have seen this yesterday. So what we have done yesterday is we have shown, what I have shown, that if you downregulate the right temporal parietal junction, you can basically decrease charitable donations. 
And there was a discussion yesterday how we did it. Uh, we also showed that gray matter volume, by the way, in this temp RTPJ is positively correlated with altruism. And there, the question came up how we did this, and then we had also functional activations. And so I looked it up again <laughs> to satisfy your curiosity how we did it. And basically what we did is for our functional analysis, we looked at the meter study, Desetti and Lam, and they, these guys, what they did is they had many studies that showed the activation of TPJ in mentalizing tasks. We, we just took basically these studies together uh, and looked at, so to speak, the, the center of these activations and that's, that was basically our region of interest, not also here for the gray matter volume st study and for the functional analysis. So we had two, we took the same region of interest uh, for, the, for the brain ant anatomy correlations and for the functional activation studies. Okay, so we can also, down, we can also affect something as important as human altruism. And uh, we can also, do something as complex as affecting people's social norm compliance. Now, social norm compliance is, some, is really, really, really human. You see, primates do have culture. It's not clear whether they have social norms, but we have social norms. And what we did in this study is the following. Think of the ultimatum game again. In the ultimatum game, I, make you a, I propose a division of the pie and you can say yes or no. What does that mean? In the ultimatum game, you can punish me by saying no, because then we have both nothing. So you can, you can sanction me. And that is different from a situation where you cannot say yes or no, where I, am the dicta I can dictate the division of the pie, and you are just a passive recipient. And we have a within-subject comparison between these two conditions. And what does that give us? Well. In the condition where you cannot say no, you're basically at my mercy. And it's my, purely my altruism whether I give you something or not. Okay? So, or I would say voluntary norm compliance also, because we know to some extent that, at least in some stylized version of this game, and we have the stylized version here, it's the 50-50 split. Whenever the 50-50 split is possible and mana comes from heaven, it's different when you worked for the money. But when mana comes from heaven, let's say the pie, the experimenter gives the money. And so it's, it's basically random whether you are the proposer or the responder. Then the 50-50 norm applies. Okay, so we have a social norm. We have an identified social norm. It's the 50-50 split. And now we can see whether people live up to that 50-50 split in the condition where they can dictate. Okay. We can also see to what extent people change their behavior when they can be punished by a no, and we call, the we call one type of behavior, namely in the dictator game where I can dictate voluntary norm compliance. And we call the difference between what you give in the dictator game and what you give when you can be punished, sanction-induced norm compliance. And we can, so we have two objects here, voluntary norm compliance and sanction-induced norm compliance. And now we can look, we again look at the, at basically the lateral prefrontal cortex, and now we use TDCS. TDCS has, is less focused, so that's why we call it lateral and not torsolateral. <laughs> so there's less focus, and of course I don't believe that it's only this brain area that do, does the job here when I see changes in behavior. The next step is clearly identifying the whole networks that are affected by, by the stimulation, but it's interesting to know what the stimulation does here. And what we do is we apply anodal stimulation and cathodal. Anodal is basically increasing the excitability of the neurons in this area. Cathodal is decreasing the excitability. Okay, in, in, in let's say, easy parlance, down regulation, up regulation, okay? So what do we see here? This is, what we, this is the, the impact of brain stimulation on the right lateral prefrontal cortex on norm compliance, on sanction-induced norm compliance. And what you see here is, this is the placebo condition. And when we increase, so to speak, neural excitability, there's a really big behavioral effect. They, they, they become more compliant now. And when we downregulate the area, they become less compliant. 
So you might think, oh great, here we have a tool for psychopaths uh, to, to make them more pro-social. However, unfortunately, it's not that easy because when we look at, at voluntary norm compliance, here you see again the sanction induced effects on sanction induced norm compliance, we see this pattern. So we see opposing effects on sanction induced norm compliance and voluntary norm compliance, suggesting that these two things are neuronally very different animals. And it will be quite interesting to see uh, what the networks are that are involved here. But for the time being, my main job is just to convince you that by affecting neuronal excitability, you can really dramatically influence behavior in these games, suggesting that these neural activities really have a causal impact on important behaviors. Now, let me give you a preliminary summary here. There are many studies that have shown that there's a direct cause effect on important economic and social behaviors, and all these studies use one or another form of brain stimulation. It affects the punishment of unfair behavior, the propensity to behave altruistically, the propensity to comply voluntarily or via sanction threats with social norms. We can affect how impatient people are, okay? Or we can affect their willingness to pay for goods or their response to, for example, reputation incentives. You see, reputation incentives are also kind of, a, are very close to this idea of, you do something good today because you have a benefit tomorrow, because you, rep you have a good reputation. So it's also kind of this tension between short and longer run. And when you downregulate those lateral prefrontal cortex on the right side, people, are less willing to, to, to act pro-socially under reputation incentives. So what does that imply? Well, that implies, in my view, that a comprehensive understanding of human decision-making requires knowledge about these neural interactions and neural mechanisms that are related to these behaviors. So that's a prima facie case for the relevance of neuroscience for behavioral sciences, I believe. And, uh, Okay, having said this, um, I tell you what I'm going to do in the remainder of my presentation. I will now focus on out-of-sample prediction. And it's a joint paper with these other people, Chris Burke, Tony Williams, and Philip Tobler. They're all in, in Zurich. Tony is now in Maastricht. He was a uh, doctoral student. And what we do is we have a modified ultimatum game where people can reject or accept unfair offers. And we look, what we do is we record brain activity in this modified ultimatum game and we, we see the behavior. And then we estimate the behavioral model and then we have the brain data. And so we have now two competitors for out of sample prediction, if you like. Which variables predict better out of sample? And what is the out of sample game? Well, it's a, what we call a redistribution game. So the people can vote for redistributing income from the rich to the poor. And so it's a game that's very close to the previous game in the sense that people can express their views about fairness or unfairness. But we want to know, do the behavioral variables, how well they predict, and how well do the neural variables predict? And in this horse race, as a neuroeconomist, I would, of course, love it if the neural variables do better because I would have a showcase for the economists to say, look, your model does poorly <laughs> and the neural variables does very nicely, so maybe it pays to look at these data. Okay, so, okay, let's, let's go on then. So we have a modified ultimatum game and actually it's, 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 it's done like that. So I'm lying in the scanner let me, let me make it easy. Let me go just to this screen. So I'm lying in the scanner. I see these screens, fixation cross, then I see 50-50. That relates to the effort, and i tell you in a minute what effort is here. And this, is, this relates to effort, inequality or equality. This relates to pay equality or inequality. So in every trial, there may be a screen like this, and in this case, effort is equalized across the two individuals. 
but one individual gets 20 Swiss francs and the other individual gets zero. And now I am lying in the scanner and I can now accept or reject and let's say I'm the guy who gets the zero. <laughs> uh, I will reject probably, okay, with high probability. Now there, there are other trials where this is 10-10 and here you have effort inequality like 60-40 or 70-30 and so on. And what does it mean? What, I mean the pay inequality has an immediate implication because that's what people get. Now, what does effort inequality mean? Well, at the end, they have to work for the money. <laughs> and at the beginning, we measure how strongly they can press this dynamometer. And we, 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 we ask them to maximally press. And then they, for example, if it's 50-50, they get the money that's in, if, if, if I, as a, scanning, as a scan subject, accept, that money is given to the subjects for 50% of their maximal effort. Okay, that's the idea. So there's inequality in effort. In, so we deliberately had two modalities here to see whether it's, it's processed in the same way in the brain. So whether there's per se an inequality detector in the brain basically in terms of neural activity or some connectivities. Okay, that's the setup and, and now let's, let's see the behavioral results. Well, this is the, the results for pay inequality and what you see here is that this is the probability of acceptance. And this is when you get, this is disadvantageous inequity or inequality. And what you, what you see here is if you really get almost nothing, the, the, the re rejection rate is really high or the acceptance rate is really low. And this is very steep here. What does that mean? Well, people on average, they really hate to be behind. Okay? And they reject a lot in that situation. If they are ahead, well, they're more willing to tolerate being ahead. Also not too surprising, and it's, it's nice because it also lines up with my model. <laughs> I, I invented, let's say, I think now 15 years ago, and this is the most beautiful confirmation of the model I've ever seen. I had seen many more rejections, I must say, than confirmations. <laughs> so, but here I have a nice confirmation. So, uh, and when you look at effort inequalities, it's, it's very similar. So people have uh, great intolerance against disadvantageous being in the, on the, on the, in a, in a, in a disadvantageous situation relative to the other guy, if they are in the advantageous situation, well, there are a few guys who think this is not fair and they also reject, but you see it's much less steep. So rejection rate is basically maximally, well, here's the acceptance rate 20, the rejection rate is the complement, it's maximally 20%. Okay, these are the behavioral data. And now, we have a measure of inequality aversion here. We can do this in many ways. We can estimate the Fehrschmidt utility function of, of, of this model that I developed, or we can, we can just take the slope. For each individual, I have such a pattern, basically, and they differ. And people who have a steep slope, they really dislike inequality. And people who have a, a weak slope, they are more tolerant of inequality, okay? That's our behavioral measure of inequality aversion now. And now let me come to the, to the redistribution game, okay? I come to the brain data later. Now the redistribution game goes as follows. The same subjects, they are put, they are now out of the scanner. They're no longer in the scanner. Uh, you see there are two, two rich subjects, two middle subjects, and one poor subject. And now the rich sub, the, there's one thing on the agenda, on the, okay? You can make a vote to, redistrib to take away seven Swiss francs from the rich and give it to the poor, which increases equality in this game. And, and so basically what we did is every subject was assigned, randomly assigned one of these roles. So I played once in the rich role, once in this role, and once in this role, okay? And so we have the information about their behavior in all these roles, and then one role is randomly chosen to be relevant, and uh, voting is realized. Now I should add something which is important. The middle income earners, they lose half of Swiss franc in case of redistribution. So they are in principle also against redistribution if they are selfish. But it's, let's say you don't need a, a much altruism, or you don't need much altruism to be in favor of redistribution, okay, here. So that's the game. Now let's see what we get. 
before, before I tell you what we got behaviorally, let's think about uh, the predictions. Now, if you are in the poor role, what do you vote? Well, self-interest tells you, I'm in favor of redistribution because I get more money. If you dislike disadvantageous inequality, you also say, I hate that even more, okay? So it predicts the same. Disadvantageous inequality aversion and selfishness predicts the same, so it does not discriminate. For those in the middle, the cost of redistribution are negligible, so it's dif difficult to say what they will do. If they are totally selfish, they will vote against redistribution. If they are a little bit of altruistic, they will vote for this redistribution. But the interesting case is if you are in the rich role. Because in the rich role, it's against your self-interest to be in favor of redistribution. And so here you have the interesting tension between self-interest and fairness. And the, the question that we are interested in is, to what extent do our behavioral measures of inequality aversion predict behavior in the rich role? And we have to look at one particular type of inequality aversion, namely the advantageous situation. Because here, when I'm in the rich role, I'm in the advantageous situation, Am I willing to give up something? So going back to this graph here, it's this slope that's relevant. It's not this slope that's relevant. So we have a specif specific prediction. The, the behavioral parameter here should have no predictive power because that's inequality version in the disadvantageous domain. The behavioral paramet parameter in this domain should have predictive power, okay, if the model is a good model, okay? So, yeah, so what do we get? Well, we get what, what I just told you. People with a high inequality version when they are in the rich, when they are in, in the advantageous domain, they are vote more strongly in favor of redistribution than people who are, have low inequality version. So usually we would stop here and say, oh, great, <laughs> we have done great. Uh, you take this median split and model verified and fine. Uh, and actually it's, it's even better because in the, the parameters in the disadvantageous domain, the behavioral parameters in the disadvantageous domain, they have no predictive power for voting behavior. That's exactly as it should be, okay? But now, Let's go further and let's ask how well do we predict, not just bigger and smaller. So quantitatively, how well do we predict? And that's on the next slide. And here I show you a, re a probit regression. So what does this regression show you? You see here the marginal effects. The dependent variable is here the vote in favor of redistribution. So it's a binary variable, it's one or zero. And one standard deviation increase in behavioral inequality aversion, IA, so one standard deviation increase, increases the vote for redistribution by 23 percentage points. Okay, so that is nice, it's also significant. Now we have here the, the gender variable. The R square is not too good. Uh, and if I add gender, look at that. So women seem to be the natural left-wingers, so to speak, according to this data set. <laughs> they, there's a strong gender effect here. So women uh, are more willing to vote for redistribution here. And when I put both variables in, this becomes no longer, is no longer significant, but the women, the gender variable stays significant. So what do I have? It's kind of a fragile effect, and I have 11, I explain 11% of the variation in voting behavior. So it's really not, not that good. Also, yeah, usually we are satisfied with this, okay? Or very often. So now let's uh, look at, well, this, here is a reminder. There's this famous book by Nisbet and Ross in 1993, The Person and the Situation, where they have, have their attack on personality psychology by saying, well, these personality variables, they typically predict less than 30% of the variance. 30% is already really, really good. And typically, it's more like 15%. And that's where we are. <laughs> okay, that's where we are. So, 
with this data. Now let me come to the neuronal data. So the question is, can we do better with neuronal variables? And uh, when I talk of neuronal variables, I mean the bold signal in the F from the fMRI study during the scanning exercise in the previous game. Okay. So now let me come to the neural representation of inequality first. Is there something like uh, an inequality detector in the brain? Is there a brain area that encodes inequality? And here, here we found really nice data. So this is in the effort domain, this is in the pay domain, and you find activation on the left and on the right uh, lateral prefrontal cortex that is nicely correlated with inequality. And it's regardless of the modality, and uh, it's regardless of whether it's uh, disadvantageous or advantageous inequality. So it's just inequality that seems to be encoded in this brain area, which is, is, which is mod not modality specific here, which is, I think, an important finding that it's really related just to inequality detection for the moment. Maybe it's also related to behavior, of course. We don't know that, okay? So I, I'm a kind of a, a little bit premature in my interpretation here. What the data tell us here, it's related to inequality, and it could also be related to rejection behavior, okay? So now let me ask the question, should we expect that activity in this brain region is a predictor of behavior? Or is it just a detector of inequality, okay? And now, and should we expect that neuronal activity in this brain area should predict what people do in the rich role? And the answer is probably not, because for the very reason that this seems to be, the neural signal is not specific to advantageous or disadvantageous inequality. The neural signal is just a representation of inequality. It's not specific, but we look at, at this advantageous domain, and so we, sh we, we would search for something more specific, okay? And by the way, a lot of, I've done a lot of research on these kinds of games. Inequality aversion in the domain of advantage, when you are ahead, is kind of a different animal than when you are behind. There are just different motives kicking in that when you are behind. We've seen it yesterday. We have seen yesterday, for example, when people are behind, TPJ has no predictive power for their altruism. But when they are ahead, TPJ has predictive power. So there's something more complicated, there's a complicating factor coming into the picture when they are behind. That's not present when they are ahead. And, and that's another re reason why I believe that we should not believe that this general inequality detector, this encoding of inequality should per se already have predictive power, okay? So that's my argument here, so, and, but we could ask still, we could still look, look statistically whether it has predictive power, and that's what we did. So does neural activity in the lateral prefrontal cortex, in these, these blobs that you have seen as the inequality detectors, uh, does that predict uh, voting behavior? <laughs> uh, well, this is what you see. Yeah, there's nothing. You have you explain two percent of the. Very, it's nothing basically. So neural activity, so which basically corroborates the previous argument. It's this activity is really better interpreted as a representation of inequality, and not as something immediately behaviorally relevant. But of course, this information needs to be. The brain needs to communicate the detection of inequality to some other areas, otherwise we wouldn't see the behavioral effects. So, so that suggests maybe we should look at connectivity, because we have discovered where the inequality detector is, and that the information in, about inequality that has to be transferred to some other brain region in order to become behaviorally re relevant. And this is when we started looking for connectivity. Okay. And the connectivity argument is basically on, the, on this slide is, and I already gave it to you. So we asked the question, is there increased communication between lateral PFC and other brain areas as inequality rises? 
because that information needs to be communicated in order to make it behaviorally relevant. And, and what we do here is a standard technique. We, we apply psychophysiological interaction analysis. So we look at, we take the LPFC as a seed region, and we look how does the correlation between the seed region and other, bra and other brain regions, how does that change as a, as a function of inequality? Okay, that's, the, that, that's now the, the analysis we do. And, and then we plug in these connectivities as regressors and see what we get, okay? But let me move slowly. So does brain connectivity predict inequality version? So first I wanna know, does this PPI that we did, okay, does this predict behavior in the initial game, okay? And what we find is, we find six brain areas that meet this criterion. Okay, so they all increase communication with right lateral PFC in response to higher inequality, and subjects with an above median increase have significantly different inequality version than those with a below median increase. So apparently, this is connected to res behavioral responses to inequality. This is both, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think I should look that up. <laughs> so, but that's a really good question. Uh, so, so brain connectivity in the ultimatum game is predictive of subject inequality version in the ultimatum game, which is reassuring because we want to have candidate regions, okay? Now, of course, we have to bond for only correct when we take these connectivities and what we ask ourselves is, does brain connectivity in the ultimatum game, so these six connectivities that we have, okay, do they predict voting behavior in the redistribution game? And when we do Bonferroni correction on these six, only one survives. And that's a connectivity between lateral PFC and DLPFC. That's the only one that survives as predictor in the voting game. And so we can ask how well does that connectivity predict behavior in the voting game? Uh, going, going beyond, so to speak, just saying, well, it has some effect. Okay, so let's do that. Uh, here, here is again the, uh, a nice picture that you see here. Basically, the people who vote against redistribution, they have stronger connectivity. So it's kind of, I mean, this is now bold reverse inference, okay, but let me do it. <laughs> uh, which is this region telling this region, wait, wait, there's inequality here, wait, wait. <laughs> Don't act quickly uh, and inhibit, so to speak, the vote for redistribution, okay? Whereas the people who have go, uh, vote for redistribution they have even uh, uh, connectivity in the, in the other direction here. Okay, so this is what we see at the qualitative level. Now let's look at the, let's look at the quantitative level. So how well does neural connectivity of LPFC predict voting behavior for redistribution? Well, here you see again our uh, neural activity data. This is the regression you have seen with this meager R square and zero impact of, of activity in LPFC. But here we have connectivity. And we look at, again, a standardize. We standardize it so we can say one standard deviation increasing connectivity. What does it do quantitatively? And that's what we find. So this is a really big figure. A one standard deviation increase in this connectivity gives you a reduction by 47 percentage points in voting for a distribution. And look at the R square. And when we add, well here you see we add the, the activity variables and it even rises. So it's a pretty robust effect. So it's, I'm almost tempted to say, Nisbet and Ross, look at this table. <laughs> uh, maybe when we look at the neural level, we get 
deeper into people's personality in some sense or get closer to, to that than what we can capture just with behavioral variables. Now let me go on uh, and uh, let's add the behavioral inequality version parameters. Now this is the horse race table. Let's put them all in and see which does better, okay? And you have seen basically this is uh, when I put in advantageous inequality aversion, the slope measure for pay and for effort, and there's nothing significant. I put in my connectivity variable, and it stays. It seems to be a really robust effect, and I get an R square of 50% with that regression. Now, let me add uh, the other regressions. Let me add the connectivity, just the connectivity variable and the female variable. Recall the female variable made the initial inequality version variable insignificant. But here it does nothing. Actually, it stays insignificant. That suggests maybe that connectivity here is even related to the gender difference and cannot tell something about the neural basis of the gender difference that you observe here. Here you see the full regression. And the full regression, well, we see the connectivity variable here. It stays highly significant, has this highly high effect, and we rise to an R square of 50%. So anyway, when I saw this, that the female variable is no longer significant in this regression, I thought, well, maybe this brain connectivity measure is underlying the female male difference in voting behavior. And so we did, what we did, what I did on my next slide, yes, I looked at it, and, and it is indeed the case. So these are, this is the connectivity measure. And uh, what we see here is that males generally have a positive connectivity, females have a negative one, and it's significantly different. And so not only does the neural connectivity measure outperform the behavioral measure, it also gives you a potential explanation for the observed gender difference here which I find quite remarkable and nice. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying this is the last word, but it's a nice word. <laughs> uh, now let me come to the end, basically, or almost to the end. So what, what have I shown? Well, I think there is no doubt, and I don't have to convince the convinced, uh, that the brain is the physiological substrate of the human mind. Neuronal activity and connectivity is the language of the brain and neuroeconomics and social neuroscience or decision neuroscience, the goal of these disciplines is to explain the human mind and human behavior in terms of the brain's language. And I think it's a feasible project because neuronal activity is causal for human behavior. We have seen that. And by using both neural and behavioral variables, we can do better. There's no reason to neglect these neural variables uh, at the minimum, we should all look at them, even if we remain skeptics, uh, because uh, they tell us something about the human mind and about behavior, and they even allow us to do better out of sample predictions. And I believe they give us, a, in the long run, a better grip on personality differences also. Now, let me come to my final slide, <laughs> which is, now I have no further slides, so this is, this is an experiment I initially thought I will present both, but that would have been too long because it's a complicated experiment. And so what we did in this other experiment is the following. I was interested whether I can predict people's motives. And by definition, a motive is a mental construct that I cannot observe. Typically, we infer motives from, let's say, behavioral data or reaction time data. But what if two, two people or a person in one situation does the same than in the other situation? How do you know which motives were at work if, it, if you have behavioral equivalence, if, if behavior is observationally equivalent? And that's exactly the situation we were interested in. So there's observational equivalence in terms of behavior. Now, does, do brain, does brain connectivity data or brain activation data allow me to predict your motive that underlies your behavior. 
that caused your behavior in a sense? And the answer is yes. I'll tell you how we did it. We have a, an altruism task, and the altruism task is just a dictator game. It's this game that uh, we, so to speak, uh, always use in order to measure that. And, but before that altruism task, we, we induce a motive. We induce empathy and we induce reciprocity. How do we induce empathy? I induce empathy, so you're the subject. You know that I'm, so to, you know me, not, I mean, I'm still a stranger, so we, we, we are familiarized at the beginning, then I leave the room, you're lying, well, in this task, you're not lying in the scanner, you are seeing a computer screen, and uh, from time to time, uh, the other subject, that is me in that case, gets an electrical shock. And you know it's a painful shock because we also apply it sometimes to you. But uh, you, you see this other subject in pain, basically. And that's how we want to induce empathy. And we have some manipulation checks. We do indeed induce empathy because in the, ulti, in the subsequent dictator game, the subjects behave more generously to these subjects, to these other subjects that, ha that have been in pain before, okay? Then we induce reciprocity. How do I do that? Well, I take, let's say, Drajan, you see me in pain, and now you can pay money to liberate me from pain. And I know it's you who does it, okay? And then in the subsequent task, I'm sometimes paired with you. So I feel grateful. And we have also some manipulation checks that show that I'm more altruistic towards Drajan because he, he, he took away some pain from me. So we induce empathy and reciprocity. And then we do something which I find really nice. <laughs> we, uh, during the altruism task, we look at, we, people are in the scanner in that task. And we do connectivity analysis, but this time not with psychophysiological interaction analysis, but with what has been called dynamic causal analysis. So there's this group in London, Fristen and Klaus Enno Stefan and others. It's a beautiful technology that allows you, so to speak, to reverse engineer the brain data that generated the bold signal. And then you take these brain data as your primitives and you look at connectivities between brain areas. And what we do is we run a contrast just for altruistic decisions between the two motive induction tasks and the baseline. And that gives us three areas, the anterior cingulate cortex, the anterior insula, and the ventral striatum. And so we have three areas that are activated in these motive induction tasks more strongly than in the baseline. And so this is our network we are interested in. We call it the altruism the potential network, okay? Because these were the decisions, this was the excess activation in these areas. These areas showed excess activation relative to baseline when people behaved altruistically. So now I look at all possible arrows that co can go from all, all physiologically possible arrows, okay? Connectivities between these regions. And that gives me kind of a typical signature associated with a particular motive. And I show you this signature here. So in the baseline, you get connectivity between ACC and AI, and this needs to be differently interpreted from PPIs. Because now this arrow indicates to what extent the level of brain activity here changes the level of brain activity here. So that's the interpretation. And you see that in the baseline and in the empathy condition, that looks very, very similar. Look at that. So which is suggesting to me, in a shameless act of reverse inference, maybe the, what you observe in baseline is really empathy-driven altruism, okay? And that, that's nice, a nice story for Dan Batson, 
who was the pioneer in psychology for proving the role of empathy in altruistic behavior. And it seems, yeah, this looks really, really similar. But we find even more. We find that people are heterogeneous here. You know? And the altruistic guys, they have a positive number here. And the selfish guys, they have a negative number here. You, you, they really are different. And when you induce empathy in, in people, what happens is that the pro-social guys, they don't respond to that empathy prime. They don't change their behavior. In a sense, they are already pro-social. But the selfish guys, when you prime them with this empathy induction, they suddenly become more pro-social. And you know what else? You make this negative number. You turn it into a positive number. So you, it's as if this connectivity, I mean, I can't claim causality here, but maybe the communication between ACC and anterior insula, and by the way, we know from many other studies, there's this famous study by Tanya Singer and others, where they show that people, when people empathize, then it is ACC and AI exactly that is playing a role. Uh, and what we see here is, and actually what she also finds is that when you measure people, I think it's AI, I don't, I don't know whether it's AI or ACC, but when, when you have empathic concern, when you measure empathic, empathic concern in people, that's strongly correlated that personality trait is strongly correlated with exactly activity, I think, in ACC. She didn't do connectivity analysis. But what we find here is by turning basically this number here from a negative to a positive number, you turn people into altruists or stronger altruists. And I think that's a nice insight. And moreover, what we also do is that we have this so these are the best models that describe the population of players best in these different conditions. So we have a neural signature. You see, reciprocity looks differently. It has, there's the arrow going in the other direction here. And from the neg this negative, so to speak, number turns into a, a strongly positive number. So it seems that the reciprocity motive has a distinct neural signature that can be used to predict the underlying motive. And that's what we do we use a support vector machine, a machine learning tool, and, the, and we feed these connectivity parameters into the machine learning tool. And the machine learning tool tells us whether people, let me be more careful here. So I have, let's say, 30 people, and I, I train the machine on 29 of these 30. So what does that mean, I train the machine? That means, I have a statistical relationship between the connectivity parameters and the, 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 the motive induction condition. And now I feed Drashen's connectivity parameters in, into the trained machine. And the trained machine tells me, is Drashen in the empathy condition or is he in the reciprocity condition? So what's the driver of his, of his, of his altruism? And you know what we get? We get an 80% accuracy here, almost. We, 77. So, so this is really remarkable. And you know, it's not that I take, let's say, Drajan's behavior in the first 50 trials and predict Drajan's behavior in the second 50 trials from brain activity. No, it generalizes across people. You see, this seems to be not person-specific. I mean, of course, there are individual differences. But it's sufficiently general that it gives you a predictive tool for identifying motives and predicting motives across individuals. And I think uh, that also t is a beautiful instance, in my view, how you can better understand the human mind with brain research. Because now we link, basically, important social motives. Maybe these are the most important social motives that are behind altruism, gratitude and empathy we link them to a specific neural signature that's so general, even general across people, that you can predict people's motives. And with these words, I would like to close and thank you for your attention.
So I just have a, um, a few comments, and I'd like to leave time for questions. And I want to thank Ernst for a stimulating talk, as usual, and for Alfonso for inviting me to share my remarks. So um, I don't know if anybody has remarked on a cultural, slight cultural difference between the European style of neuroeconomics and the US style. Uh, uh, it, it, I think I would say Ernst is a, a leading representative of a European style in the sense that there is an emphasis on social motives, on fairness, on, on norms, on equity. And the US style often is concerned with individual self-control, uh, time discounting the way individuals screw up. And there is, there is a slight uh, difference in, in interest. Now, what is, what is, I think, in the background uh, of the question of, and, and I have to say these remarks are somewhat improvised, is uh, the question whether uh, self-control is necessary for social motives, and what is the interplay, whether we are uh, naturally nasty and then need self-control to act in a pro-social way, or whether we're naturally good and then need uh, self-control to be responsibly selfish. And this afternoon I recalled a kind of shocking uh, story. I was in London last year, and so I was following English things. Uh, a shocking story about an initiation ceremony at the Bollingdon Club at Oxford. Now this is, uh, this is apparently, I don't know much about it, but it's apparently the poshest uh, undergraduate society at, at Oxford. And uh, what makes the story politically interesting is that David Cameron, the current prime minister, was a member, as was Boris Johnson, the mayor of London, potential future prime minister, as was George Osborne the, uh, uh, in the cabinet, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and the initiation ceremony was done in 2013, and it's something like skull and bones at Yale or whatever. <clears throat> and so, if you imagine what an initiation ceremony is, uh, they must think of, <clears throat> come up with something that's, um, uh, that, is, that you basically don't want to do, that is in some sense uh, repulsive, repugnant, and then you do it to prove that you're a member, member of, the, of, the, of the fraternity. And what they did, according to news reports, is to the, initia the initiation ceremony involved uh, each new member uh, finding a homeless person, taking out a 15 pound note and burning it in front of them. That was, that was a ceremony as reported in the newspapers. Okay. Now, uh, actually, uh, don't want to slander this society. I'm not sure if this is true. There's some controversy, but it was taken seriously enough that it was discussed in the House of Commons and the Labor Prime Minister said this is disgusting, repugnant, et cetera. But uh, <clears throat> what's interesting about it is if, if you imagine, I mean, it sort of proves the point that uh, members of this society are not psychopaths because if they were psychopaths, this would not be a difficult thing to do. It actually is a very difficult thing to do. And you have to use all your willpower. I mean, you can imagine a normal person would have to use all their willpower to engage in uh, this, this, this uh, type of um, uh, antisocial behavior. So um, now I, w w Ernst gave us three samples, and he had a much larger portfolio of studies, this, this enormously rich portfolio of studies, three samples. And then at the beginning, he made some general comments about uh, neuroeconomics. But I, I, I want to say just a few things about the three specific studies <clears throat> in the form of questions, and then uh, a few remarks about neuroeconomics itself. Um, so actually, no, let, let me go the other way. Let me go the other way uh, about neuroeconomics. And speaking here as a, uh, as a believer in neuroeconomics, uh, I'm going to pose uh, skeptical questions that you often hear ab about the field. And the skeptical questions can come either from, uh, from neuroscience or psychology or they can come from economics. So uh, from, uh, from neuroscience, psychology, if you're looking at this, you might ask yourself, uh, why are economists in this game at all? That is, shouldn't they be worrying about interest rates and the macroeconomy? And if you were in a nasty frame of mind, you might say, <clears throat> given that their analytical tools and methods have not proven so 
impressively successful in their own home discipline, why are they now exporting it uh, to other disciplines? And uh, that's a reasonable question. I think it has a good answer. The other question from economics is one really, uh, who cares, which is uh, their version of the software-hardware uh, uh, distinction. What does it matter uh, how uh, our uh, theories are being implemented at the brain level? So these are the, the kind of the two basic skeptical questions. Now, the first one I think is actually more interesting. So what, what can economics bring to the table? Um, I think it does three things. First, it owns uh, the normative model of decision-making, both at the individual and at the collective level. And that includes not just uh, optimization, but also includes the use of, uh, of uh, information, signals, uh, Bayesian information theory, and so on. And, that allow, and it is striking that the most productive, the most productive empirically examples of the theory are uh, clustered around uh, predictions that on first pass are incorrect. So if you look at the, the famous games, the uh, uh, empirically famous games, starting with Prisoner's Dilemma, which, which we all know, then the ultimatum game where uh, a person proposes a division and the other, the other person then can reject and nobody gets anything. And uh, 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 these, are, these are games where uh, the normative prediction is, is totally incorrect. And then this generates a search for what are the missing motives, what, what is missing in the picture. Uh, another example which, which uh, wasn't mentioned today is the beauty contest game, where everybody proposes a number and the person whose number is closest to the two-thirds of the average of all the numbers wins. And that's again the prediction. In that game, the Nash equilibrium prediction is zero, that everybody should predict zero, assuming the numbers are initially confined to an interval. And of course, zero will not make you a winner in that game. So, so, uh, so there's a whole list. In fact, uh, interestingly, the one area where game theory is reasonably accurate predictively, which are zero-sum games, um, are, are relatively barren experimentally. So, uh, so economics gives us these uh, wonderful empirical predictions which are incorrect, and then we have to decide what to do, how to adjust, how to adjust the model and what is missing. Um, another way to put it is it gives us st uh, strong wrong theories. Now the second thing it does, it gives us experimental paradigms. Now these experimental paradigms, like the ultimatum game, um, are remarkably um, uh, austere from a psychologist's point of view. That is, the natural instinct of a psychologist is to create an illusion, a slice of life in the lab, and this is precisely what's not done with, uh, with the, economic, um, in the economic experimental paradigm. On top of it, <clears throat> there is um, what economists call the sacred principle of no deception, in, uh, which rules out a lot of experimentation. Um, so this austerity, the experimental austerity, has advantage and disadvantage. The advantage, of course, is that um, it's absolutely clear what you're doing, and across different labs, you're doing pretty much the same experiment. And essentially, the instructions are, all con are usually just confined in the, in the payoffs. The payoffs are the instructions. Now, the disadvantage is that, from a subject's point of view, it's a little bit like a Rorschach situation. Uh, you have the payoffs, and the experimenter assumes that certain psychological motives are generated. But you have to ask yourself, are these, are these all of the psychological motives? And in the, it occurred to me in the last study that Ernst mentioned, I think that's a live issue, because in the empathy condition, what happens in the empathy condition, there's a subject in the scanner that's occasionally being shocked. And then there's two subjects outside. One is also being shocked sometimes, and one is not being shocked. I think that's the, that's the paradigm. And the question, then is, do I feel empathy towards the person who's being shocked? And that's measured by how much I'm willing to, essentially, uh, the difference between how I'm willing to divide money between myself and my partner who's also being shocked and the person who's not being shocked. Now, one way to think of it, if you're the subject, is to ask yourself, why is that third person not being shocked? Wh what is going on in this experiment? That third person is getting off scot-free. That, that, that could diminish the amount of money that you would, that you would uh, uh, 
give to that person. So, so the, precisely because the, 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 um, the paradigm is so uh, simplified, it, 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 uh, it's, it's important to see what, what motives are come up. The other limitation, and this is um, maybe less of a central one, is that um, in a sense, there are some motives, motives that rely on self-deception. And, and Jan, Jan Elster, uh, the philosopher, has written very interestingly claims that, for example, envy and, and, and ressentiment is a motive that can never be admitted. That the only way to create this motive is if you um, uh, is by deceiving yourself and believing that uh, you essentially subconsciously transform um, envy at somebody's success into a feeling of justified uh, hatred of that person, that kind of thing. So these are motives that would be very difficult to, to create uh, with, this, uh, 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 with this apparatus. Uh, then the third thing I think that, that economics brings, and this is a theoretical uh, 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 attitude or, or, or actually a theoretical constraint, is that within economics, you're always modeling the complete individual. That is, you always have actions, you have beliefs. So you're over, always uh, modeling in a, in a very stylized, simplified way, you're modeling the complete person. And that's not the case in, um, in neuroscience or in psychology. You could be studying a module, a particular, uh, you know, let's say memory. But uh, in economics, you always have in mind that there is a complete individual uh, making decisions and, um, and, and processing information. Um, so, uh, one last comment uh, I want to make on um, on the ultimatum game. The the um, I would say, by the way, this, that the second the second study actually uh, I think that you mentioned provides some some support for the idea that it takes um, self control to be selfish. Because as I take it, the brain evidence says says that, and I and I think I misread the slide in, uh, the first time. But the, the, the brain evidence said is that if you increase, uh, as connectivity increases between the uh, putative indicator of inequality, symmetric indicator of inequality, and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which we believe is responsible for self-control, uh, that, that increases in people who uh, are not in favor of redistribution, are not in favor of redistribution, which means that uh, you register, now I'm uh, free, uh, free associating or in freely interpreting the results in a, in a way that's often risky, but uh, that, that if, if you are the type of person who doesn't redistribute, uh, you have to exercise self-control and say, no, they're going to get there a uh, small, small outcome. We're not going to, we're not going to share. Um, so, actually, I think I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to stop my comments to leave time for questions uh, and just say uh, the other skeptical comment coming from economics: Who cares about what's going on in the brain? And I think that is an impossible one to answer. Uh, but it really depends if we, if you view these studies as pieces of a puzzle, it really depends on whether you believe that once the pieces uh, come together, uh, you sort of, you know already what the picture will be once the pieces come together. Uh, I think that's not true. I think when the pieces come together, what we're gonna see is gonna be very different from anything that's uh, hypothesized in economics or, or probably in psychology. And from that point of view, it's going to matter crucially to understand uh, what, the, what the brain is doing, so. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, th there's nothing to, di to, to disagree for me. No, no, no. Yeah, questions would be good, yeah. So I'll take questions. So we have time for a few questions. Yeah. We should give you the microphone. But it's difficult for the others to, to, to hear you. I, I was curious to think whether this kind of study of the prediction of voting in an economic context could be extended to a, a voting in a political context, typically um, election, be it presidential election or otherwise, 
because many voters would say that that well, I like this can I, I don't like this candidate, but I have to vote for him because of the lesser of the two evil, or I have to stand by political party line. And conversely, um, it may also be true. So uh, there's more complexity in that area. And secondly, and the uh, contention that uh, neural activity uh, causally determines the, the uh, uh, individual behavior, human behavior. I, I think there's something missing there. That that is a, a feedback mechanism. Be human behavior would in turn feedback and modulates the um, modulate the, the, the newer activity. So I think that's yeah. Missing but there. Th I agree with that. So there could be feedback loops. But in the experiment, I have that under control. You see, I randomly assign people to one type of stimulation or the other, and uh, when I do, when I combine it with with fMRI, so I think that will anyway be the future that you do the brain stimulation, and you 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 have people in the scanner so that you know the the distributed network effects of the brain stimulation, but it's clear that you have a causal intervention here, and you have a clear you can make a clear causal inference. That's the beauty of it. You see, I, I'm a big uh, this this is why I like the brain stimulation tool so much. It's fMRI alone is, is great, but very limited. So I think we need the, the causal to start to really make progress. And I, there's no doubt that we can make that causal inference, I would say. It's like I'm taking a knockout, having knockout mice for genes, you see. In the end, that's how you prove that the gene is relevant for, for the behavior. Uh, and here you knock out some neural activity, so to speak, temporarily. So here I, I think we are on safe ground, yeah. So there was a question in the back here. Yeah, yeah it's, it's difficult to bring it back, so, yeah, so just speak very loud. consistent in your attitudes and if you start off poor for distribution and it's very hard um, to you know <coughs> still be still be um, like be against redistribution once you're rich because then you would you know use a lot of it, that's a lot true of your, so uh, this is I completely agree with you it would have been bad a bad experiment if you would not have randomized but is, is there is there a do you think there's a relationship within like do people who start out rich and then have to take the perspective of the poor person in the end, behave differently to the people who start off poor and behave as a rich person in the end? Because Let me say, I don't know. I would, I would have to go to my postdoc, Chris, and ask him. I'm sure that he did the check. Uh, but uh, I, there are so many things. You see, you have, you have uh, 500 tests that you do, and then you have these data sets, and, then three years later, you report it. You, you only remember 120. <laughs> so this is the problem. But I'm, on, I'm pretty sure that he did uh, the check that it could belong to standard practice. Yeah. You had a question, then you? So in, in the reciprocity game, you, you allow people to pay for reading somebody's yeah. pay. Yeah. With the idea of perhaps it will pay down the road. So did you think about perhaps changing uh, the game such that instead of making them pay, to make them gain for shocking somebody? So and to see how many go for it and what what price? So that would be neg in using negative reciprocity. Yeah. So I would have done this when I had subsequently played an ultimatum game. <laughs> then I induced basically 
yeah, you, you behave antisocially. That with Lamon was like burning the 50 pound notes in front of a homeless person. Uh, that would create probably uh, quite some hostility and more willingness to reject. And so that would be the motive induction for negative reciprocity. So it's a good idea for that, but I didn't do it. This was hard enough. You see, this is really not trivial. Our, and the main problem is how do you ensure that the guy who is in the reciprocity condition and the other guy who is in the empathy condition, they must have received the same amount of shock, same number of shocks in the end. So we, we really have a very elaborate procedure that makes that, we have some random, yeah. I, I couldn't tell you now, basically, although I designed it uh, because it was so not so easy to design. So that. Because otherwise, people could say, well, the, the guy in the reciprocity condition, he got himself lots of shocks. He was sometimes freed from the shock. But the guy in the empathy condition, he only saw the other guy getting the shock. And then all the brain activation later on could be attributed to, to having received different numbers of shocks. But he kept that constant. It was one of the challenges here. So, but there was a question here. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I was how the human agency and like Will Tobel was mentioning in the chat comments would kind of fit into this whole switch of the economics. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I have uh, stayed away from this discussion uh, about, you see, explaining something in terms of neural activity is not denying automatically that people have free will. The relationship of that concept to to these other things, I have always left this discussion to the philosophers or the quasi philosophers, to be honest, because I thought it's the same. You see, there there are some things that are not solvable at a particular point in time. Let me give another example. So this discussion about is there psychological altruism or not, like true altruism. I think it's, it's an interesting question, but we are not capable of resolving it right now. So I concentrate on, you should choose your questions such that they're demanding, but not too demanding. <laughs> so, so that's a very important. That's the art of choosing questions, I think. It's very important. And if you, uh, yeah, that's a very demanding question. That's not irrelevant, but uh, Sorry, you, you, and you. Okay, so, so it's, it's hard to go around doing functional MRIs on people and try to predict what their behavior is. It would be nice to have uh, structural markers. Do we know if the, the functional connectivity is uni unidirectional as opposed to bidirectional? Yes, we know so that. that. that, that here. different effects on the structure, one from the other? You see it here. In this motive, it's bidirection. In this motive, it's unidirection. But do they have different effects on the structural connectivity? I don't know. No. But there is a nice paper, I think it's published already by the Glimpscher lab, where they do risk taking tasks and they measure uh, gray matter volume in parietal cortex and they replicated it, I think, two times. So, gray matter volume in parietal cortex, in some parts of parietal cortex, seems to predict person's risk aversion. And I think gray matter volume is a great biological variable that plays a role in personality psychology in the long run. Yeah. Uh, you, you had a question. So you mentioned that in the baseline condition, there were some individual differences between um, the model that was generated for people who donated more versus those who gave less. I'm wondering if you have enough power to see any um, resolution of whether for people who donated more, did any of them happen to show anything that was like reciprocity model? Can you say again? I didn't put it. So you mentioned that there were some individual differences yeah. in the baseline condition. Exactly, here in this connectivity. Oh, sorry. In this connectivity here, yeah. Right. And I'm wondering if, um, given that there were individual differences, it's surprising to me that in the baseline condition, the only thing that was possibly going on is empathy causing donation. And that yeah, I was wondering if you had any resolution enough subjects 
Okay, that's a good question, yeah. Well, I think, you see, let's say prima facie, you're in a dictator game. You've never seen that person in the baseline. Well, in the baseline condition, you have seen it for the first time, perhaps, during the experiment. And then you're lying in the scanner and the arrow points in this direction, and that's that guy, okay? <coughs> it's hard to imagine any, I mean, he didn't do anything to you. He didn't choose anything. He, he was completely passive. So it's very hard to imagine a reciprocity motive here. Here's a follow-up. Uh, if uh, in the baseline condition you had clicked on I stop, do you think you would have gotten anything that looked like the reciprocity pattern? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, actually, that would be nice. So that, that could shed <coughs> new light on these eye spot studies. Yeah, we could do eye spots. Uh, but you know, the eye spots, we, did, we have an eye spot study. Um, where we apply the eye spots to the second person, to the reciprocator, and there they, we don't find an effect. So I think eye spots are one of these fragile effects where you find sometimes there's something and sometimes not. That's my view, but other people have different views. Okay, thanks a lot.